We learn from a young age, and quite rightly so, that eating fruit and vegetables is a great part of a balanced diet. If we spend all of our lives eating Haribo and chocolate and things like that, then that is going to be extremely unhealthy for our bodies, and the natural way to stay healthy is to create a balanced, varied diet. Now on top of just vegetables and eating vegetables directly, like in a salad and things like that, or carrots and peas with your, with your roast dinner, this plant is known as rapeseed. Rapeseed. Rapeseed is part of the uh, mustard family. Now rapeseed is one of the most common sources of vegetable oil. So we obtain rapeseed oil from this plant. And these kinds of oils are very important for us for two reasons. One of them, they are important in food because obviously we cook a lot of our uh, food in oil and vegetable oil is the healthiest oil we can use. We don't want um, all of this man-made oil which is normally really unhealthy and hydrogenated. So vegetable oil uh, in food and another one is for biofuels. So oils can be used to cook food, they can be used directly in food and we can also use them in order to give us energy in terms of fuel. Now we should know that an oil is an example of a fat. However, we know that when we eat vegetables, well vegetables don't really contain any fat or barely any at all. And so where does this fat come from? Well the oil is obtained from the seed of the plant. So we normally eat the leaves of plants, such as lettuce and things like that, but the seed of the plant is where we get the oil from. That is not the case in all plants, but it is with regards to the rapeseed plant. So we find rapeseed oil in the seed of the plant. What we then do is we crush those seeds, and therefore, once crushed, the oil is free and we are able to extract it. We must process it because there will be impurities in that oil and we want the oil to be as pure as possible. So further processing will lead to the useful product or the oil. Now another interesting one is lavender. So we've all heard of lavender oil. If we have a lavender plant, we can extract it using steam and distillation. So you'll of course remember fractional distillation where we separate loads of things at once but simple distillation is separating obviously far less. Now what happens here is slightly different to normal distillation because we are using steam and we'll separate the oil from the water at the end. So what happens is we take a lavender plant and we crush the lavender plant and we put it into boiling water. Now let's get a diagram of that to show you. Okay, so here we go. We've got our crushed lavender in here and we have a steam generator here. You don't need to remember all this equipment, by the way. This is just to make it clearer for you. And so what we do is we heat our boiled plant material and the oil will actually evaporate at around about the same temperature as water. And so both of those will run through this condenser. And so we have here, I'll do it in a different color so you can see it properly. There we go, we have here in red, we have our lavender oil and water. Now because oil and water are very different substances, if you leave them on their own, they will separate on their own. So if you've ever seen um, milk after it's gone off, you get a thin layer um, of oil and a layer of water. That's because milk is an emulsion, and we'll come on to that in a second. But milk is an emulsion, it's a mixture of water and of fats. That's the same thing here, because fats and water don't want to be together in one mixture, they will actually separate. And so we leave it, and we can actually then extract the oil from the water. Okay, so as we mentioned, vegetable oils can be used uh, for food. So we can cook in them, and we can also add them directly to our food. They are very important because they are actually quite a healthy source of fat. They also contain something called vitamin E, Vit E, okay, which is important for us, and they also contain a lot of energy, and therefore um, they are much better than other kinds of fats. Now, I'm not going to go into too much detail about this, but a fat or an oil is just like the hydrocarbons that we've seen before. So, an alkane, an alkene, and now you've seen alcohols as well, they are all hydrocarbons, and a fat is no different. That is also a hydrocarbon. So, you'll have some carbon chain. Let's pretend that this is our oil. It's not what they look like, but 
there we go. And so this is our oil, and each of these will be surrounded by hydrogens. And if I'm being realistic, you might have something that looks like this. Um, don't worry about this at the moment. But you can see that this chain here, there we go. So this chain here is a is, is pretty similar to what you've seen in alkanes. So if you, if you ignore the left-hand side, this pretty much does look like an alkane. So we would call this oil... This is not vitamin E, by the way, I've just realised, that might be slightly confusing. This is not vitamin E, this is, this is an imaginary oil. And this part here shows you whether this oil is saturated or unsaturated. Because we've all heard about saturated and unsaturated fats, and this is what we actually mean. So saturated will mean that there are no carbon-carbon double bonds here. And as you can see, there isn't. That means that the chain is going to look most like an alkane, and that would mean saturated. Now, if we had a double bond somewhere here, we could say that this is now an unsaturated fat. And so that might look something like... We need to get rid of those hydrogens because now those carbons are double bound. That would look something like this. This is what we would call an unsaturated fat unsaturated. Okay, so there is a difference between the two, and the difference is that double bond. And if you had a look at my video on alkenes, you should know that we can test for alkenes using bromine water. What that bromine water is actually testing for is one of these carbon-carbon double bonds. So therefore, we can use exactly the same test here in order to detect the saturated or unsaturated property of the oil. So, the experiment would look something like this. You would have a test tube with your oil inside. Let's just draw that in grey because they're not really coloured. So here we've got our oil. And normally we'll dissolve it in ethanol just because, remember I said we can use ethanol as a solvent when water doesn't work very well. Oils don't dissolve very well in water so we can use ethanol and it would work better. So the oil dissolved in ethanol. And now, if I add bromine water, so bromine water, and if this happened, you add bromine water and you end up with an orange solution, you know that that was a saturated oil. So that equals saturated. Reason being, because if you add bromine water and there is a double bond, the bromine water will react with that double bond and therefore the orange colour will leave. If the bromine water, which is orange, stays orange, it means that it hasn't reacted, which means that no reaction has occurred and you have a saturated oil. So our test results, when we add bromine water to a saturated oil, it stays orange. When we add uh, bromine water to an unsaturated oil, it goes from orange but then it reacts, so it turns colourless. There we go, that's better, colourless. Just to show you, you've gone from orange to no colour. Okay, so that's how we test for oils. Now, we obviously mentioned that we can cook using different vegetable oils, but how does that actually work? So just to demonstrate the point, here we obviously have two very different types of exactly the same food. So, both are potatoes, but both of them look very different, they taste very different, and they are cooked, obviously, in a different way. On the left, we have everyone's favourite, which is chips. And chips are, of course, cooked in oil. Normally, we fry them, sometimes we deep fry them, and that, that's probably the worst kind of chips you can get. On the right, we have a jacket potato, which a lot of the time is just baked, and this does not use oil, and therefore, that is the reason for the difference in appearance and taste. So what is actually happening when we cook is that the heat that we apply to the food is causing chemical reactions to occur within the food, which converts it, if you like, from a raw state to a state in which we are able to eat it safely. Now, depending on how you are cooking it, and more importantly, what you are cooking it in, those chemical reactions are going to be different. So the chips are being cooked in oil, and so the oil is going to react with the potato, in a different way than obviously with the baked potato when there's no oil. So, in chips, different chemical reactions and also some of the oil will actually go inside the chips. So they will soak up some of the oil as well. 
And remember that oil is a very high energy um, source of food. So fats have a lot of energy in them, the most out of any type of nutrient, really, because we've got proteins, carbohydrates, and fats, and per gram, fats have the most energy. So if we have loads of energy, that means loads of calories, and that can become unhealthy if we eat too many of them. So the chemical reactions work differently because of the presence of oil. The oil will actually react with the food itself. The oil will get inside the food and overall it just creates a different environment which produces different results. Now obviously a baked or a jacket potato is healthier in general than a portion of chips but sometimes oils are essential for us or they they are definitely beneficial for us. So some foods cooked in oil and the right kind of oil can give us health benefits. In the case of chips, normally the oils have been converted into something more unhealthy and it's just a bit too much. And so a conversion of oil, this is going slightly higher level now, converting oil into other kinds of oil is known as hardening. Hardening, okay? The reason it's called hardening is because an oil is normally thought of as being a liquid. Depending on how many double bonds there are, so how many carbon-carbon double bonds there are in the oil, this will dictate how runny a liquid it is. So the more of these guys you've got, in general, the more runny your liquid is going to be. Whereas the more of these guys you've got, just single carbon bonds, the more solid it's going to be. So if you've got pretty much all of this, so saturated fats, you could even be pretty much a solid. So when you're looking at things like butter and lard, those are pretty much solid, and that is due to the saturated fat content. Whereas if you've got all these guys, a lot of things like olive oil and other vegetable oils are very runny, and they're almost, um, they almost run exactly like other liquids, and therefore that is why they, having these carbon-carbon double bonds is why that they are like that. So these guys are unsaturated, these guys are saturated. Now, when we, when we say hardening, we are going to convert a runny oil, so these guys, into a not so runny oil, so these guys. And that's why it's called hardening. And so what we're going to do is add extra hydrogen to the double bond. Now remember, if I use an example of ethene, this is not a fat, obviously, it's an alkene, but it has this carbon-carbon double bond. If I add hydrogen to ethene, right, this is all hypothetical, by the way. If I add hydrogen to ethene, I can crack that double bond. And now, look, I've got a saturated hydrocarbon now with extra hydrogen in there. Okay, so that's demonstrating the point. And what we do is we add hydrogen to our oils rather than ethene because of course we're talking about oils here. So if we have something, I don't care what it is before this, but if I have a double bond, yep, in a double bond each carbon has three bonds here, here and here, so it can only bond to one hydrogen. Same with this guy and then he's bound to something else as well. What I'm going to do is I'm going to add hydrogen there. So plus hydrogen we do this at around about 60 degrees, so 60 degrees Celsius, and we use a catalyst, and this catalyst is nickel, so nickel metal. Okay, so we run this over nickel metal, and these hydrogens here will add across this double bond here. Okay, yep, I'll write the hydrogen in this color so you can see where they've come from. So we're adding hydrogen. What we're going to get is our carbon, Remember, don't care what's on the left-hand side, but there will be something there. And this is what we started with. Carbon, hydrogen, hydrogen. But look, now we have a single bond here. And that is because we have added our extra hydrogen. And now this has gone from being unsaturated to saturated. And this is a process known as hydrogenation. Hydrogenation. Don't get this confused with hydration. Because remember, hydration, we need to stay hydrated, and that is when we add water. So hydration is reacting with water. Hydrogenation has hydrogen in the name. So hydrogenation. So don't confuse those two, because they do sound similar. 
but when you hear about a hydrogenated oil, you'll always hear about them in a negative way because they are just not healthy for you at all. They can clog up your arteries and cause all sorts of problems. But we can do this to make the oils more solid and you find those oils in things like cakes and biscuits and um, pastries and other sort of man-made fatty foods like that. So in general, not good. Avoid hydrogenated fats if you can. But if you have a, you know, a balanced diet where you're eating the right things, now and again it's okay to indulge. But this is the reason why they are bad for you. So I hope that's helped. Please do leave me a comment below or send me an email if you've got any questions and I look forward to seeing you in the next video.